Hello, and welcome to the Family Histories Podcast, the show that celebrates those of us who are sat in archives, libraries, spare rooms all around the world, tirelessly piecing together our collective family and social history. My name is Andrew Martin, and yes, I've been one of those people tracing my family history since 1995. In this episode, The Pimp, I'll be joined by a guest whose family history research has led him back to Sicily in Italy. We'll hear about his great-grandfather's life amongst the gangsters of New York. And then we'll return to Sicily to try to demolish their current research brick wall. So, set aside those census returns, grab a cuppa, and let's meet our guest. My guest today is a writer who has written for loads of different publications covering food, health, fitness, and he's a founding editor of TransHealth.com. As you might expect, though, he's also a family history addict. But it doesn't stop there, because his speciality is in researching mafia family history. It's therefore time to don our best listening ears and associate ourselves, see what I did there, with my guest, Justin Cassio. Hello, Justin. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. It's great for you to be here. Um, I've just uh, alluded to uh, a certain something in the introduction there. Um, but before we get to that, uh, I'd really love to know what it was that started you off on this wonderful pastime of genealogy research. Oh, what a fun topic. I can talk about genealogy for uh, forever. <laughs> Good. It wasn't always like that. I had almost no interest when I first started hearing about uh, where my family is from, especially what I would consider the more interesting side, which is the Sicilian half of my family tree. Uh, I've done a lot of work on my grandfather's side of the tree based on stories that my grandmother told me. Uh, I know a little less about her side and less still about my mother's half of the tree. I got interested in finding out my family's immigrant story, how we got to America, how we became Americans, uh, as a part of what you might describe as a midlife crisis. I wanted to know more about who I am, what made me, um, the ugly forces that created the United States, um, and to come to terms with uh, relationships that I, I can't ignore, I can't hide, they're just so deeply a part of me. Okay. So I started studying history, and it led me to genealogy. As you've kind of evolved in that path, um, have you therefore been looking at American records or Italian Sicilian records? I've looked at both. Uh, from listening to a few of your shows, it sounds like we have different sets of records that we rely upon. Um, the records that get me super excited are draft registrations from the World Wars, naturalization petitions. Those are the best. Uh, census every 10 years. Uh, but then there's the Italian records that I also had to get into. And that's where I really had to um, ramp up on my skills. Uh, because while it's easy for uh, Americans to get started by uh, putting on family search in the browser and uh, typing in some names into the search box, mm -hmm. if you want to get into um, the really good, uh, hefty church records from Corleone, none of those are indexed. So, um, but but family search carries them. So you go find them. You have to page through them, and you have to read the handwriting okay. and use the old indexes. That sounds like quite a challenge. Um, what's your Italian and perhaps more specifically Sicilian um, language skills like? They were zero when I started. <laughs> I mean, I could say manja, you know, and okay. um, that's it, really. I, I still can't even like ask for a beer or anything, like <laughs> no conversation skills. But my Latin skills are getting pretty good. Uh, okay. Uh, and and I can, I basically, I, I can read a form. Uh, I start, I, all the marriage records are written in the same formula. So you get used to, okay, there's going to be like two or three lines of preamble where the priest is bragging on himself before we get to the meat of things. Who is getting married here? Who are they related to? And that's the important part. And then sometimes where they're from. Great. So which of the records that you just referred to do you prefer the most? Because you were talking about uh, censuses uh, and parish records. Is mm -hmm. there kind of a safe place that you like to go? Uh, yes, definitely. Actually, <laughs> it's a happy place for me to go into the marriage records okay. uh, for Corleone, okay. which are in Latin. They're handwritten. They're unindexed. Um, 
I know where all the indexes are and then I've bookmarked them. So uh, I have a huge, huge, like thousands of names probably list of people that I'm looking for. And they're all separated out by what index I think I'm most likely to find them in. And then I've got little notes associated with them about where I've already looked for them and uh, an idea of where I'm going to look for them next. That sounds exceptionally <laughs> organized, but maybe through necessity, given that they're not uh, indexed in family search and you're having to manually trawl through them. I guess that is a part of it, but uh, I think the the big part is I'm trying to keep track of a lot of people. And if you're just doing one family tree, as you know, mm -hmm. it just expands every generation. You know, you're looking for 24 great grandparents or however many it is. Yeah. And by the time you get back in time, any appreciable amount, you're really looking for a lot of people. And that's just with one person. And I've taken it upon myself to look for a lot of people. Part of that is because when I started doing this, I had no idea what I was doing. And okay. when I was looking for my great-grandfather in Corleone, I thought, hmm, Leo Luca Cassio. That seems like an uncommon name. I've certainly never heard it before. I'm sure it'll be a cinch to find him. Turns out Leo Luca is one of the two patron saints of Corleone. It's okay. an extremely common given name for boys. <laughs> and um, Cassio is a pretty common name in town, too. Okay. I found, like more than a dozen Leo Luca Cassios in the period that I was looking for. And I didn't know which one could be mine. All I knew was what his siblings were named. So I looked at all of them. And I <laughs> kind of got a little mm, detail-oriented. I don't know how to describe it. I, I, it, got, it became a, a one-place study. I started off with names in my family, and I just researched all of them. And it became this amazing, um, like a lattice, basically, on which I could hang knowledge of other families from the same time frame. Wow. So I knew so much about these families that I could intuit things about the rest of the families that lived around them. Wow. So it, re it really does feel like a one-place study. It really is. Yeah. And it's a place with a lot of gangsters. Oh, <laughs> that I mean, that just makes it more addictive to, to keep searching, I would have thought. I mean, family history is very addictive, but to then discover that there are gangsters amongst them, that just must be, that, that must just really fuel an addiction. It really does. I started this wanting to know who I was and, and how we got here. And um, basically, I wanted to, I'm, I'm the kind of person that puts a pin in a myth every time. If there's a taboo or uh, okay. a story about, oh, like my favorite to put pins in is um, we, we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. First of all, that's a physical impossibility. You cannot pull yourself up by yeah. your bootstraps. <laughs> and so, well, where did our bootstraps come from? Well, we were white. And so they came from the labor of people of color very often, and their misery and death. I mean, terrible, terrible history, American history is. So where does my Italian immigrant family come into this when they're just joining the, the, the whole story around 1900, which is about when my family got here? What does it mean for us? So okay. that's where I started trying to put those stories together. So what did my family's bootstraps look like in New York City circa 1900? I have like one family story that tries to explain that. And it is that um, my great grandparents, the Soldanos, sold olive oil out of their apartment to their neighbors in East Harlem. Okay, And I was like, hmm, okay, interesting story. I mean, it's like... Is that really like the secret of their success? They sold olive oil out of their apartment. It's the only thing I have. I don't even know if it's a true story. And so I just tried to like put it together. It's like, okay, well, they said they were buying the oil from this relative. Let's go find that relative. And just to um, understand like what, what was the oil economy of Corleone? How many trees did a, a peasant have really? Is this, a, is this story plausible? And when I was looking for those relatives, because... um. There was a set of siblings that all immigrated together, except for the oldest girl. She stayed, she married a first cousin, which is a thing that happens in Corleone. Mm -hmm. um, but it was those two relatives who were the ones who were said to um, produce the olive oil and send it to New York for okay. the relatives to sell. And what I found was that those relatives were cousins to Giuseppe Morello, who was once known as the boss of bosses of the mafia okay. in the United States. <laughs> that suddenly gets uh, a lot more interesting with that name. If you could maybe have access to a record that you've yet to find, or maybe you could imagine up a record, what, what do you wish you had access to? Actually, there's a record regarding Giuseppe Morello that I wouldn't mind having. Okay. Uh, there's some disagreement about whether he had two or three sons by the same name. Um, and 
one of them might have one of these children might have died as a baby in Texas or Louisiana, and then they might have had another child within a year or so with the same name because because people weren't really sure about their ages in this population that I'm studying. It's not uncommon for somebody's age to kind of slide around a little bit in the records. And so there's a bit of that. Um, and so I'm not convinced that there was a death and then a birth of another child. But if there was a record of either of those things happening, either the death or the birth of the other child, it would answer the question definitively. So you said that you kind of had to work out how to genealogy. I don't know if that's the correct phrase. But uh, do you think that there's a really great piece of advice that you could give to someone who's starting out now? Absolutely. That would have saved you a ton of time when you started? Um, Induction is not the worst way to find out what you want to find out, like I did, where you basically just find all of the details until you have a pattern, and then and then find your answer there. That's one way to do it, but it is definitely the most time-consuming way to do it. There are more streamlined ways to find your ancestor. What does genealogy mean for you? Before I knew exactly who my people were, the uh, connections that I was talking about to the American people, to uh, to whiteness in America, to, um, to that history, uh, to the immigrant experience. It was all just stories in a history book. And being able to figure out how my little story fits into the big story has given me a sense of place. I'm, ex- I'm, I'm not in contact with many members of my family, and that's not uncommon. Um, but... So there's this um, this distance that I have from my family, and also a sense of um, of not belonging. And doing this work has demonstrated to me that I do belong, that I am a part of that story. Do you have uh, connections with people who are back in Corleone, who are in your family? I do. I have this great fourth cousin, Gina, and she's she's terrific. Um, We had kind of a mystical experience once, um, and it's totally through the internet. Uh, We were uh, both looking at Google Maps, the satellite view at the same time, looking at the apartment that at one time in history, my ancestors and her ancestors shared. They lived together in that one apartment. And we were looking at it at the same time and just both feeling this kind of a thrill of of the history of it, because the story is that um, my twice-great-grandmother... Angela Grisafi, uh, she was widowed and she moved to New York to go live with her sister, who is my cousin Gina's ancestor. Uh, and my family stayed in New York and her family went back to Corleone. It's through Gina that I have the only picture that I have of my twice great grandmother. I think that's a really uncommon thing for an American to, to own. Most of us don't, even, don't know anything about who those people are that must have been a nice moment for her to be able to 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 share that with you i hope she understands how priceless it is i've (laughs) I've certainly told her (laughs) obviously you you have a speciality in uh researching the mafia um and i believe that you have a book somewhere in the process of having been written or about to be published what was it like kind of committing all of that in, into into a book it's a it's still a, a process right now um i finished draft two and i'm gonna have to get started on draft three but in the meanwhile i've um i'm no longer on a contract to produce a particular book so it opens things up a little bit and i think what it's going to wind up doing for it is taking it back to its roots which has always been i wanted other italian americans to understand what i do about what our place in history is. I guess because you have some distance courtesy of history, um, does that change your opinion of maybe some of the things that that you have found? Because obviously if you're researching your family, inevitably you want to be accepting of those people and you want to love them and, you know, they're your relatives. But sometimes they do things that are not great. Um and so has that. So has your research kind of changed your perception of any of your relatives? I don't think that I um, start off with a very sympathetic view of my ancestors. To be honest, I I I don't start from a place of of, of love necessarily. Um, respect. I I I appreciate that I'm here because of them, and 
and that uh, part of my obligation to them is to know their story. Uh, but it doesn't mean that I approve of the things that they did necessarily, the choices that they made. I do want to understand how big their world was. And I have a feeling that in most cases, their worlds were much smaller than mine. They had very few choices compared to what I live. It's now time for Relatively Speaking, the part of the show where my guest picks one of their most fascinatingly good, bad, or just plain ugly relatives and tells their life story. So, Justin, who are you going to introduce us to? Naturally, somebody ugly. Uh, it's my great grandfather. <laughs> my fingers were so tightly crossed for this. <laughs> Go for it. I told you about my grandmother. This is my paternal grandmother, my father's mother. Uh, when I was little, I thought she hung the moon. She was perfect grandmother, they were the kind who slips you money, who defends you from your your parents yelling at you. I mean, that kind of just wonderful, loving grandparent. Um, They're all like that, though, right? No, no, definitely not. I had a really kind of a cool relationship with my mother's parents. Okay. Uh, it felt more like visiting a hospital, a really small hospital. But my grandparents' house on my father's side was like visiting a very small palace. They had chandeliers in their house. I live on Long Island, and if you've never been there, or this is where I grew up anyway, mm -hmm. is on Long Island. And there are a lot of what are called Levitt towns on Long Island, which means that it's a suburb full of houses that are all exactly the same. I grew up on a high ranch. It's a two-story model. All the bedrooms and stuff are upstairs. Every house on the street that I grew up in was a high ranch. My grandparents, in like three towns away, lived in a high ranch. Okay. So I kind of had a, a weirdly narrow view of the world until I moved away from Long Island when I was 12, which was that everybody was Italian or Jewish. Everybody lived in a high ranch. I figured that the whole country kind of looked like this, but that what you did with the inside of the house could be very, very okay. different. So my grandparents' house was lavish. They had actual chandeliers in their house, um, velvet drapes, uh, of an ivory colored baby grand piano. Okay. My grandfather was a professional musician. Wow. So that made sense. Um, that sort of, um, French regal furniture with plastic covers over it. If you grew up Italian American, all of this, you're laughing because you've seen this already <laughs> at your grandparents' house. And we would all go there on Sundays and I would see my cousins. We would all play and we would have big, Big Sunday dinner, you know, the table decked, huge bowls of pasta. And you can imagine it, right? And um, bit loud, spirited conversations. It was that sort of a household. And I told you I had a few stories from my grandmother about my grandfather, because they went back to Corleone together in the 50s and visited. And my grandmother had great stories about that visit. She was horrified. Dirt roads, the streets were full of flies. She was pregnant. So this was none of this was welcome, including the long, bumpy road from Palermo to Corleone. Oh, dear. So when she got there and she saw they didn't have a front door, she almost died right there on the spot. How am I going to live with the flies? Oh, they had a beaded curtain for a front door where they were going to go stay. But she says they went inside and it was immaculate. There was not a single fly in the whole house. The beaded curtain actually works. So sometimes the old knowledge is good. Um, but she told me about my grandpa. Uh, my grandpa was from there, and she told me the story about the olive oil. Uh, but she didn't have a lot of stories about her own growing up, and she grew up in New York, where she was born. And um, she told me about her mother and her grandmother, who she mostly grew up with. She told me her grandmother was extremely vain and would bathe every day, which was apparently an unheard of luxury in New York. And like we're talking about the 1920s. Uh, but she didn't have any stories about her father, Giuseppe Longo. I never heard about him. It was almost like she was spontaneously generated from a line of women. So uh, when I found out a little more about him, it was uh, when my Aunt Alice died. I say my aunt, but it was my grandmother's sister, okay. so my great-aunt Alice. When she died in Florida, um, I was able to see some pictures of the documents that were associated with her burial, and she was buried with her father. And since I now had my uh, great-grandfather's burial papers, I finally knew exactly when he died. Uh, I had some some now uh, a date to put with us. Let me tell you, very common name. I thought Leo Lucocasio was bad. Giuseppe Longo is like the Bob Jones of Sicily. <laughs> There's just uh, you're never gonna find him with that just that name. And the problem was he would give varying accounts of where he was from. So um, it's like I don't know exactly how old this guy is, and and um, and then I don't think he was living with my 
with the family, you know, that was the impression that I got from my grandmother. Okay. So I was finally able to start piecing together some more of his story after um, I found out exactly when he was when he died. So I was able to get his date of birth from Social Security records. And then from there, I was finally able to figure out which of all of the Giuseppe Longos was my great grandfather. And wouldn't you know, those records pointed me to his Sing Sing prison register. Oh, okay. So... He was in a max uh, security prison when he registered for the draft one of those two times. Um, the first one, I believe. And so that's a really great record because it's got um, your date of birth, mm-hmm. your place of birth. Yep. It's got a contact person on there. It's 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 a good doc. And he did it from inside prison. Um, and so f- I was able to, from there, trace it to the stories about him. Why was my great-grandfather in prison? And these were like right before... He married my great grandmother. He was in prison, and it looked like from the dates he married her right after he got out. So, what was he in there for? And this is where I was able to find the answers in the newspapers. Uh, I think I probably found it in the New York Times first, but one of those one of those um, great sites with the newspapers, like Faulkner, I found articles about um, what they called white slavery okay. back in the day. Um, he was um, a pimp. He abducted young women. He forced them into uh, prostitution. And uh, there was a couple of different occasions on which he was documented to do this. And um, he was tried and convicted of, that, of, of, uh, of those charges. And that's what he was in prison for. Wow. And let me tell you, I've... I study the mafia. I study mafia families. I, st- I look at what they do. I'm not the kind of person who's really interested in the gory details, but it's always a part of the, the story. And like Lucky Luciano, who people think is such a great gangster, he was a pimp and a dope dealer. I mean, he was not a great person. He wasn't somebody we should admire for any reason. Um, and my great-grandfather was a just a disgusting, repulsive pimp i mean he the things that he did to women i can't i can't love or forgive that i'm not gonna try um it explains a little bit to me about uh how my grandmother might have grown up maybe feeling about men maybe that they were not trustworthy i mean she did grow up with just you know nothing but women i mean it it just it gives me something else to think about like what was her life like and and then um and why she had nothing to say about her father do, do you think that uh, because she had nothing to say that she either did not know or she was just so utterly disgusted either could be true i mean she had the sense not to tell a terrible story like that to a little kid yeah uh maybe her mother also had the good sense not to tell her about yeah. about that and she did seem to be a pretty sensible person my great-grandmother divorced Giuseppe Longo. I mean, that to me is shocking. I always thought that my generation was the first to have a divorce in it. Uh, I had no idea that my great grandparents got divorced. What sort of year would that divorce have been? Like around 1960. Yeah, I've got the paperwork. Um, I wasn't able to get a lot of details, but that's when they divorced. And it seems like um, it happened in Florida, which um, my grandmother, my great grandmother didn't live there. She lived in New York. Uh, Okay. But my Aunt Alice was living there, and so I think that um, my grandfather was living. My great grandfather was living with his daughter in Florida, and me, and so that was where the divorce was 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 done. He lived another ten years okay. in Florida, and then he was buried there. Um, my great grandmother um, petitioned for naturalization by herself. Like that's a really uncommon thing to see in these records. Um, it's really common for a man to do it, and then he takes his wife and children all with him. Um, but to see a woman do it by herself, it's usually because there's a really specific reason. Um, and in this case, she did it before the divorce, and so she gave me valuable information about him. Once again, love those naturalization records. Um, but she decided on her own that she was going to be an American citizen and that she was going to divorce her husband. Like, she just, she sounded like a pretty cool person. So she basically kind of broke away from that situation and and presumably took the daughters with her? Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, she like, she raised them in New York. He appears in the 1930 census when the kids are small. Uh, but then after that, it's really hard for me to find the family. They've been a really tough one to find just all together. Uh, so he might've been there for a while. I don't know how much of a presence he had in the family when they were growing up. Uh, but the divorce didn't take place until after both of the girls were grown and married and had kids. So do you think that, uh, there's kind of much of a of a legacy of him left in in maybe in in your family. I, can you be notable by your absence? I mean, one of the themes that comes up for me again and again in my work and in my life because I'm estranged from my family, so I'm going to be absent from a lot of those stories that the rest of the family are going to pass down. I'm going to be like one of the people that just sorts of disappears. Um, to some people. Anyway, you know, there are parts of my family that are in touch with me. Um, And so he disappears because his daughter didn't want to talk about him, right? We get disappeared for different reasons. And it's about maintaining certain values and beliefs in a family that are essential to the family staying together. We all have to believe certain things about us that keep us together and make us special from other people that define that family. Do you think that he was disconnected from his side of his family at all? I think that he was disconnected from his siblings. I think he might have had some, and um, but they don't show up later. I don't. I don't remember seeing them in the obituary, for instance. Given that you've said that uh, he essentially worked as a as a pimp, um, do you think that uh, he was working with any mafia families who might have been there in the in the area? That would be really hard to know. It is a sort of an organized crime, but it's hard to know who he would have been organized with. Uh, the one time that he's mentioned with with a with a with a collaborator, um, it's not an Italian name. Okay. So it might have been not Italian, not mafia, organized crime, especially that early in history and probably always though. Uh, there's there's a lot of competition among small gangsters it a gang usually doesn't have a lot of longevity um usually it only lasts for the length of the career of its head the mafia is different because it gets passed down through the generations um but an ordinary gang like what my great-grandfather was probably involved in would have been of short duration or just an assemblage for that particular enterprise and then when they were done doing that work at that time, it would have dissembled and they might not have worked together again. That would, I mean, it, all of those were very typical arrangements. And were there any kind of well-known gangster groups kind of around him at that time that he may or may not have run into? The family was living generally in the East Harlem area, which is, uh, was it called Little Sicily, uh, it was where a lot of people from Sicily settled and a lot of people from Corleone. Uh, the Giuseppe Morello gang was based there uh, and was on the rise at that time. Uh, it became the Genovese crime family. Uh, and then there was a couple of other of the, of the five families of New York who were evolved from, from that time period uh, in their association with Giuseppe Morello. Uh, the Gambino family is directly uh, derived from the Morello gang, and um, and I think there's one other, the Lucchese, uh, because um, uh, Tommy Reyna was a captain under Morello, and then he spun off his own gang in the Bronx, and that one became known as the Lucchese gang after his successor. Okay, so there were there was organized. Uh, mafia um, gangs in in the area that may have I don't know inspired him or bumped into him or not wanted to bump into him. <laughs> Most likely competed with okay. him, but possibly protected him. It's okay. hard to know. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess we're not really going to run into mafia records uh, on family search. So they're the worst. The mafia don't keep very good records. It's very it's hard for to organized crime. You think they would? It's they're not that organized <laughs> well. as, it, as it turns out. It's really hard to um, <laughs> prove that somebody was in the mafia. I mean, you can kind of um, assume it, 
but most of the time, the people that we say were definitely in the mafia, even they never admitted yeah. that they were in the mafia. Um, we, <laughs> secret club. It is. How do you know who was definitively in a secret club that does crime? You can just look at some of the outside clues and see if they behave like the people who do those things. And the mafia is, um, wow. it's ethnic. Uh, there's particular kinds of crimes that they are attracted to. Uh, they operate in certain areas. There's, there's people that we know are associated with them at different times. And so if you can show those relationships, uh, either to individuals or uh, to uh, an industry, uh, like narcotics, for instance, or... Um, the garment industry at one time. I mean, really, it's a combination of legal and illegal activities that are very strongly associated with the mafia. Legal gambling in Las Vegas is very strongly associated with the mafia. Yeah. Um, but if you can show that somebody you know is doing the things that mafia does, that's pretty much the best we can do. Well, thank you, Justin, for sharing Giuseppe's story. Um, I think he definitely belongs amongst the baddies. Okay, I think it's time to face the brick wall. Nobody wants to find a brick wall, but inevitably we all do. It's the obstacle between you and your relatives that can last a few hours to an eternity. It's a gap in the trail of evidence that would otherwise enable you to continue your research. So listeners, it's now your chance to help my guest make a breakthrough. Justin. What have you got for us? Okay, so Giuseppe Longo. I'm not certain where he's from. He has told okay. us at different times that he was born in Chifalu and that he was born in Capaci. And I have a feeling okay. that he was born in Chifalu to, pa to parents from Capaci. Uh, he gives a birth date on or around the 3rd of April, 1893 but sometimes 1895, you know, so give a few, give or take a few years. Uh, he's named his parents, uh, uh, Gatano Longo and Anna Pagano. And those come off of his marriage record. Okay. And um, by looking in Capaci, I think I found one of his sisters. Uh, so I might have actually found his family, but I'm not a hundred percent sure because these are really common names. And because he hasn't been super clear, uh, consistent in, in giving the details of his life. So he's a bit cagey all throughout his life, really, to be honest. Yeah, he's a criminal. He's not really trustworthy <laughs> in a lot of regards. And giving personal information is one of them. Okay. Uh, I think the places that you were that you were talking about there, they are in Sicily? In yes. Um, Cefalu and Capaci are both towns on the coast in the same province, Palermo. But they're on either side of that big city. And so they're a little more than an hour away today by car. And, you know, back in the day, it would have taken several hours to get from one to the other. It wasn't, you know, like there were neighboring towns or there was some confusion. There are different places. And what sort of um, what sort of records have you tried or, or would you expect them to expect him to turn up in? But he's not. I haven't been able to find a record of his baptism. And so that would be the, the one main record I would expect okay. to be able to find that proved his birth in one place or another. And that would confirm his parents' names. Do Sicilian um, records tend to to state a date of birth with the baptism? Sometimes, um, certainly for records in England, you get lucky in that they've put both both the birth and the baptism in, but it's not very common. Um, so so what kind of things do you, would you expect to see in that baptism record if it was there? Uh, most Sicilians, at least in Corleone, baptize their child very soon after birth, within a day or two, very okay. commonly the same day. Oh, okay. Um, wow. And um, also a baptismal record will tell you what day they were born. And usually it's um, they're telling you that they were born yesterday or they were born on you know such a day of the current month. You know, but it's um, usually very close to the day that they're baptized. Do you think that there is a a kind of date that would be kind of the target for you to let, let's imagine you had access to a time machine? Do you think there's like a, a date and a place that that maybe uh, you could say, okay, if I go there, I'm going to find out the answer to this to this brick wall? Yeah, if we went to the later uh, of the dates that have been given for his birth, um, he already exists or he's being born so like the 3rd of april 1895 and sorry that was in 
What was the location for that one? Well, that's the thing. We're not super sure. We think <laughs> Chifalu. So as the listeners are um, potentially uh, could offer you a clue that brings your brick wall tumbling down, um, what's the best way for listeners to maybe contact you? if they think they've got a clue. Uh, my website is called Mafia Genealogy. So if you look for mafiagenealogy.com, or if you go to Facebook and find me that way, uh, you can contact me through either place. Okay. And uh, also, uh, we'll have you in our contact form on familyhistoriespodcast.com. Uh, so any listeners who think that they have a, a clue for Justin can simply just select his name in our contact form and then send a message and we'll pass that on to him. So I reckon I could probably help you out a bit with this brick wall. Okay. Okay. Uh, but we would need to go through to the garage. I have no objection. Okay. Follow me. I'm excited. What on earth is that? That is the genealogist's dream. You dream of garbage. Yeah. Oi. What? No. No. Look. It's a time machine. This is for real. Very. And uh, if you'd like to take a seat, then I'll demonstrate just how real it is. All right. So, 3rd of April, 1895. Uh, where was your brick wall again? Uh, it's Chifalu or Capaci. Ah, okay. Well, um, I'll send you to Palermo itself, and you can go from there. Now, you are sure you want to go, because you might want to watch your step. I am absolutely sure. Okay, well... You need this. Press the big button when you're ready to come home. Got it. Ah, picture it. Sicily, 1895. Oh, here we go. Justin Cassio, thank you. Goodbye and good luck. Plymouth? What? I type Pale... Oh, I hate you autocorrect. The Family Histories podcast was presented and produced by me, Andrew Martin, with additional sound production by Elliot Lees. My guest was the brilliant Justin Cassio. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please click subscribe to get the next one or consider leaving a review. Thank you. Approximately no family historians were harmed in the making of this podcast.